It is quite surprising that in the turn of the 1900s, uh, people really did not know what an atom looked like. People had ideas of what an atom might be, but we really didn't know the structure of the atom. In this lesson, we will slowly begin to go through the ages and construct the structure of the atom as we know it today. So, this will be the history of atomic theory. Atomic theory began with Democritus and other Greek philosophers. And as they ate grapes and drank wine and enjoyed the sunshine and uh, pieces of art, they also dived into the philosophy of matter. And these philosophers began to coin the term atoms. And they said that matter is made of indivisible tiny particles called, that are called atoms. All right? And after the Greeks, um, Greece went through a whole slew of war and then uh, Europe went through its dark ages and stuff like that and um, uh, other cultures like the Arabs began to build upon this um, idea of the atoms uh, but uh, their ideas were never never came into fruition due to Western powers and the suppression of these ideas in the Arab world and stuff like that. But it was only until the 1800s when uh, people, well, also the fall of the Arab civilization and also the rise of the Western civilization, um, that people began to start documenting what they are because uh, People now have, uh, have food and uh, not a lot of wars, so people can begin talking, thinking about art and science again. And came, they came along this gentleman by the name of John Dalton. And um, I guess he had free time, and he began to postulate what atoms are. And this is his atomic theory. He said, that all matter is composed of tiny particles called atoms. Well, well what we do? He didn't really make this up. He probably just took it from someone else. All right? But he added stuff like, say, atoms of an element, like atoms of hydrogen, and all atoms of hydrogen are exactly alike. And then atoms of different elements are not alike. So like, Atoms of hydrogen will look different than elements, atoms of helium, for example. Well, helium was not discovered. Uh, other stuff, okay? Oxygen, for example. And then he said that atoms combine, they combine in very simple ratios, right, to form compounds. Like water is made, well, back then they didn't know water wasn't. Uh, they thought water was an element, but um, let's just use water anyway. Like, the water is made of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms combined. Also, atoms cannot be destroyed nor created. They can only be arranged in chemical reactions. This is quite profound. These last few statements are quite profound. He, that means he set the tone that everything that we know comes in very predictable fixed ratios, all right? But we still really didn't know what the atom looked like. So it was not far ahead, not long up ahead, uh, then in the turn of the 1900s, um, right? People began to rush to, to decipher what the atom looked like. And it started with J.J. Thompson. All right, without the peak. Uh, being a Brit, he did a cathode ray experiment, and in the cathode ray experiment, he discovered that atoms have charges. And whoa, he, he knew that because through his cathode ray experiment, he could deflect 
uh, electrons and deflect protons, the, 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 the particles, electrons and protons, because by using magnets, all right? And when he put his data together, he created this plum pudding model of the atom. This being a Brit, that's what he imagined um, the atom would look like. And he said that the atom has a comprised of a very large positive charged sphere. The atom is made of a positively charged sphere. And on that sphere are little plums of electrons with its negative charge. And that's what he imagined the um, atom looked like. And further on, after that, whoa. all right, further on after that, uh, a guy came along by the name of Ernest Rutherford, and by the gold foil experiment, he created a new model of the atom. And basically, what happened was, there was a thin piece of gold foil being bombarded by alpha particles. And then around surrounding the experiment, the bombardment of the uh, gold foil by alpha particles. Um, so let me draw this, Here's the gold foil. And he shot the gold foil with alpha particles. Not exactly alpha particles, not very important right now. But he shot alpha particles through the very thin gold foil and he noticed most of the alpha particles bounce on this other side of the uh, wall, right? And um, they bounce and it came to the other side of the wall. And so he said that, well, uh, Thompson's model may not be true because if an atom was a big, huge positive sphere, then all the alpha particles should not go through there, but gets deflected. So. Most of the alpha particles went through, but some of them got deflected. And he began to postulate that in the center of the atom must be a very small, but very dense and heavy nucleus. All right, so he began to draw out the uh, atom as a very small, dense nucleus, possibly protons, because that's what he said was big and massive, and surrounded, and around the nucleus is mostly empty space and some electrons somewhere, all right? The electrons are out there in empty space somewhere. But in the middle of the uh, atom, there was that nucleus. So Ernest Rutherford began to coin the nucleus, all right? And in the nucleus, there was um, protons. Then Niels Bohr came along, and by his hydrogen ex emission experiment, he created a new model of uh, the atom. And it kind of built upon Ernest Rutherford's model, but added electrons, and what the electrons were doing in shells. And this is the model that is prevalently, uh, prevalently used uh, in IGCSE, plus a minor few details of another guy. So what he, Erner, Niels Bohr said was that there was the dense nucleus in here, but the electrons around the nucleus live in layers of energy called shells. And the electrons are moving in an orbit around the nucleus. All right? That's what Niels Bohr said. And so they said that first, it, he said that the electrons can live on the first shell or the second shell. And this model is very helpful, even though it's not accurate, but it's simple enough in terms of introducing chemistry and atomic theory to students. So, that's what he said. But notice, we still haven't talked about the third subatomic particle, which is neutrons.
So there came along another gentleman by the name of Chadwick, and he used data to predict neutrons. He said that, well, according to all the experiments that were done, uh, that was done, uh, the mass of the atoms does not correspond to the number of protons or that is in the uh, that, is, that that exists. So there must be another subatomic particle there that has no electrical charge, right? And this is what he termed by neutrons. And then he proved it by the boron alpha particle experiment. So basically, instead of gold up here, he bombarded uh, boron with alpha particles, and then he calculated some more and discovered that way, that's right, I was right all along, there's neutrons. So basically he added upon uh, Ball's model and said that the nucleus had protons and neutrons. Okay? And the electrons are out there orbiting in a nice planetary orbit around the nucleus. Then came a few more gentlemen, Heisenberg, De Broglie, and Schrodinger, and they said that, well, these models are not good enough to explain how the atom really looks like. And they used quantum theory, which is basically a complex slew of mathematical formula, and they began to predict shapes of atoms that is way beyond this curriculum. The structure of the atom is, very, is what we know as today as the most accurate uh, model, but the complexity of this model inhibits uh, first-time learners of physics and chemistry to appreciate it. So mostly we revert back to Ball's and Chadwick's uh, model to describe the structure of the atom. Next time, we'll come back and we will talk about the actual structure of the atom.